Linda Melvern, A People Betrayed, The Role of the West in Rwanda's Genocide. Immerse yourself in the harrowing account of Rwanda's tragic history and genocide in the book, A People Betrayed, The Role of the West in Rwanda's Genocide, by Linda Melvern. This summary encapsulates the complex socio-political landscape and the role of Western powers in the build-up and aftermath of Rwanda's darkest chapter. Gain insights into the devastating consequences of colonialism, the intricacies of ethnic divisions, and foreign governments' impact on the Rwandan society. Unravel the shocking narrative of mass killings, uncovering the negligence and complicity of the global community in failing to prevent the atrocities. Rwanda's Distorted Ethnic Narrative In 1894, King Ruabijuri of Rwanda met with German Count Gustav Adolf von Gotzen. At that time, Rwanda had already been given to Germany during the Berlin Conference ten years earlier. Rwanda was a beautiful, lush land known as the Switzerland of Africa, with a complex society and rich cultural traditions. Under King Ruabijuri's rule, the distinctions between the taller, thinner cattle herding Tutsi in the shorter, round faced Hutu emerged in his armies. Europeans, unable to comprehend that African societies could achieve such refinement without outside influence, attributed Rwandan advancements to a superior race, the Tutsi, dominating the inferior Hutu. As Germany got engulfed in World War I, Belgium took over Rwanda's administration. In 1933, the Belgians conducted a census, classifying the population based on physical measurements and assigning ethnic identities. This resulted in granting certain rights exclusively to the Tutsi, while the Hutu faced harsh exploitation as a peasant class, particularly in forced labor and diamond mines. Consequently, the Hutu began to unify in response to these oppressive conditions and entertained notions of a pure Hutu nation. In 1957, a manifesto written with the help of a Belgian priest in Rwanda fueled Hutu nationalism and called for emancipation majority rule. The manifesto's popularity exposed a dangerous reality, the majority Hutu now believed the European narrative that the Tutsi were foreign invaders, enslaving and exploiting them. This distorted historical narrative paved the way for ethnic tensions, culminating in the horrifying Rwandan genocide a century later. A Fatal Injection's Deadly Ripple the mysterious death of Rwanda's King Rudahigwa in 1959 sparked anger among the Tutsi elite, who suspected Belgian doctors and Hutu extremists to be behind it. Violence ensued, leading to the dissolution of the monarchy in Rwandan independence in 1961. The country then transitioned into a militarized police state under Belgian military rule. Hutu majority governments, backed by France and Belgium, began purging Tutsi from public life resulting in widespread massacres and the first large-scale exodus of Rwanda's refugees. The refugees who reached cities eventually organized the Rwandan Patriotic Front, RPF, setting the stage for an armed struggle and the RPF's invasion to reclaim their homeland. After the puzzling death of Rwanda's Tutsi king Rudahigwa due to an antibiotic injection in 1959, the Tutsi elite blamed Belgian doctors and Hutu extremists for his passing. Consequently, the nation was engulfed by waves of violence that led to the dissolution of the monarchy, formation of political parties, and Rwandan independence in 1961. This turning point carried significant and far-reaching consequences. First, the king's death signaled the beginning of Rwanda's transition into a militarized police state, as Belgium placed the nation under military rule in an attempt to curb violence. Though official military rule lasted until 1975, Rwandans remained accustomed to curfews, checkpoints, and identity checks, leading to a normalized, militarized everyday life. During this time, France and Belgium supported Hutu majority governments, which systematically purged Tutsis from public life. Tutsis were excluded from public office, education, and training, and closely monitored by the Rwandan police under French command. The first large-scale killings took place in 1963, with thousands of Tutsis brutally massacred by empowered peasants and the Gendarmerie Nationale Rwandaise, overseen by Belgian officers. This violence led to the first massive exodus of Rwandan refugees, 
with estimates suggesting around a million people fled the country. Though life in refugee camps was arduous, those who reached urban areas began to organize against Hutu nationalism. The Nairobi-based group later transformed into the paramilitary Rwandan Patriotic Front, RPF, in 1987, with the aim of reclaiming their homeland. Recruiting Rwandan youths, primarily Tutsi, from Ugandan refugee camps to join the Ugandan army for military training, the RPF prepared for a looming invasion. The Birth of a Guerrilla Machine On October 1, 1990, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, RPF, initiated their invasion of Rwanda, but the Rwandan army and French special forces pushed them back. Tutsi refugee Paul Kagame stepped up to lead the RPF and transformed it into a disciplined guerrilla army of 15,000. Facing heavy international support, the Rwandan government's army expanded, turning Rwanda into the third largest weapons importer in Africa. The disaster of war led to a far-right Hutu extremist movement resulting in the Bujizra massacre, paving the way for unabated violence. In 1990, thousands of Ugandan soldiers deserted and invaded Rwanda, commencing the RPF's ground invasion. Prepared, the Rwandan army collaborated with French forces to counterattack, forcing the RPF into retreat. Hearing about the invasion, Tutsi refugee Paul Kagame, a skilled Ugandan military officer, took over the leadership, transforming the RPF into a well-disciplined guerrilla army of 15,000 individuals. The RPF began gaining territorial control, eventually securing around 5% of Rwanda by the end of 1991. Internationally, the Rwandan government garnered widespread support due to its perceived democratic nature. Consequently, the army expanded from 5,000 to 28,000, with arms deals signed with France and Egypt. This led to Rwanda becoming Africa's third-largest weapons importer, spending $100 million, equating to 71% of the nation's budget. The fallout from this war included 300,000 refugees, a collapsing economy, and the disintegration of health and education services. Amidst the turbulence, a far-right Hutu nationalist ideology took root in Kigali, backed by propaganda campaigns and militarized groups such as the Interahamwe, the paramilitary wing of President Habirimana's ruling party. These groups became trained in killing efficiently, culminating in the horrifying Bujizra massacre in February 1992. Orchestrated as a brush clearance operation, 3,000 Tutsi were brutally murdered. The Bujizra massacre foreshadowed the horrors to come. As no justice was served, Rwandan security forces internalized the belief of experiencing no consequences for their brutal actions, setting the stage for continued bloodshed. A Sinister Plot in Rwanda In August 1993, the international community celebrated as the Rwandan government and the Rwandan Patriotic Front, RPF, signed the Arusha Accords, which promised constitutional reform and the cessation of the Rwandan civil war. However, President Habirimana and his inner circle had no intention of fulfilling the accords, instead, they secretly plotted the genocide of Tutsis. This plot consisted of arms deals, distribution of weapons to militias, the import of agricultural tools as lethal weapons, and the radio television Libra de Mil Kalines, RTLM, which fueled racist sentiments, leading to the Rwandan genocide. While the peace treaty, known as the Arusha Accords, spurred hope for much-needed reforms in Rwanda, such as refugee repatriation, army unification, and the deployment of UN peacekeepers, this hope was tragically misguided. Unbeknownst to most, President Habirimana and his inner circle were planning a horrific genocide targeting Tutsis. The conspiracy took form in December 1991, when President Habirimana met with military and security officers. Colonel Theonest Begasora, a devout Hutu nationalist, influenced the new definition of the enemy, RPF members and anyone opposed to Habirimana's party. The Rwandan government then proceeded with an extensive arms buildup, procuring $12 million worth of bombs, grenades, ammunition, truncheons, pistols, and AK-47s from a French company. Additionally, Millions of dollars funneled through private businesses were spent on hoes and machetes, weapons disguised as agricultural tools. By January 1993, 
the Rwandan government had supplied militias and individuals across the country with approximately 85 tons of weapons. When UN inspectors visited one town with 150,000 inhabitants, they discovered 50,000 weapons, including machetes and firearms. Another insidious tool for inciting genocide was the launch of the radio television Libra de Mil Colines, RTLM, station in 1993. With the sudden availability of affordable portable radios, or free devices courtesy of local authorities, the RTLM instantly became popular. Station hosts, all associated with President Habyarimana's party, attracted audiences by playing pop music, boisterously using street slang, and frequently appearing inebriated on air. The RTLM soon began transmitting unmistakably racist messages, publicly naming Tutsis who deserved death. These named individuals would be subsequently abducted by Interahamwe, Habyarimana's paramilitary unit. This notoriety fueled an alarming rise in violent racism across Rwanda. The UN peacekeepers, led by Canadian Brigadier General Romeo Dallaire, who arrived in October 1993 in accordance with the Arusha Accords, found themselves in a tense and perilous atmosphere, on the precipice of widespread genocide. Hindered UN Peacekeeping Efforts Dollar's peacekeeping mission, Unamir, was negatively impacted by political tensions and the UN's previous failures in Somalia. Unamir faced ill-equipped and inexperienced soldiers, destruction of resources, rapidly changing demographics and growing violence, but the UN did not provide the requested support. The increasing danger was blatantly evident, but the UN Security Council failed to recognize it, allowing disaster to unfold in Rwanda. When General Romeo Dollar touched ground in Kigali, Rwanda, peacekeeping efforts by the United Nations were already plagued with issues due to the Battle of Mogadishu in Somalia. The United States and the UN had engaged in a vicious blame game, leading to a disjointed organization, which dampened the morale and effectiveness of peacekeeping missions. Unamir, led by Dallaire, was intended to ensure a smooth transition in Rwanda following the terms of the Arusha Accord. However, Dallaire's 4,500 requested troops came up short, as he was tasked with leading only 2,500 poorly trained and inadequately equipped soldiers. Alongside being unprepared for the challenges, Unamir was faced with political and social chaos on the ground. The massive refugee crisis and internal civil war destabilized Rwanda, with Hutu power nationalists taking advantage of this chaos to stir up anti-Tutsi rhetoric and violence. Dollar consistently communicated the deteriorating situation to the UN, emphasizing that their resources were being strained to the limit. Despite these pleas for assistance, the UN remained unresponsive. In a desperate appeal, Dollar informed UN headquarters in February 1994 that unless they were permitted to seize weapon stockpiles, violence against both Tutsis and peacekeepers would escalate tremendously. The bureaucracy, however, dictated that these weapon seizures were beyond the scope of the peacekeeping mission, denying the request. As tensions escalated, extremist radio station RTLM hinted that something cataclysmic was about to happen. Rwandan army camps set up machine gun posts, and automatic weapons were disseminated in downtown Kigali. Despite these glaring warning signs, the UN Security Council, relying on inadequate intelligence, remained unfocused and oblivious to the imminent catastrophe. The Council convened in early April to evaluate the Rwanda situation, specifically the Arusha Accord's progress. Sadly, they ignored the blatant reality, Arusha was already irrelevant, and the country was teetering on the brink of disaster. Tragically, it was just a matter of time before calamity struck. The Catastrophic Rwandan Genocide On April 6, 1994, Rwandan President Habyarimana's plane was shot down, kickstarting the horrific Rwandan genocide carried out by the Hutu power faction. Tutsis and moderate Hutus were brutally murdered, with an estimated one million lives lost. Despite knowing the severity of the situation, the UN and other international powers failed to intervene adequately, contributing to more bloodshed and violence. On a night when President Habyarimana unusually found himself flying home, a missile rocked his journey, ending his life and igniting a hellish nightmare in Rwanda. 
the Hutu power faction, fueled by hatred and determination, pounced at the opportunity, claiming that the Belgians and the RPF were responsible for the assassination. As a result, the faction sought vengeance on Tutsis, their moderate Hutu counterparts, and Belgian UN peacekeepers. The Rwandan army and the Interahamwe militia rampaged through cities, indiscriminately murdering Tutsis and moderate Hutus alike. The horror unfolded in plain sight, as perpetrators hunted down their targeted victims and systematically attended to their murderous to-do lists. Checkpoints scattered throughout cities, and executions soon became arbitrary, targeting tall individuals and those who seemed educated. Sexual violence further fueled the brutality, sparing none from the hellish nightmare. Horrifyingly, one million people fell victim to the violence in Rwanda, the majority of whom perished within the first four days following Habirimana's tragic end. As panic and fear engulfed the country, General Begasora, a far-right loyalist, took the opportunity to seize power unofficially. Establishing an interim government, he strategically filled the seats with fellow Hutu power politicians, consolidating dominance. In the midst of the chaos, UN Commander Dollar reported the escalating genocide to UN headquarters, highlighting the coordinated terror campaign and devastating mass murders. However, Unamir's inadequately armed and ill-equipped troops failed to protect politicians and peacekeepers in Rwanda. Although the UN could have intervened, the Security Council and member states lacked the will to provide financial and material resources, resulting in their shocking inaction. While the UN hesitated, the United States and European countries mobilized swiftly to evacuate their citizens from the danger zone. France, in particular, not only evacuated its own nationals but also Rwandan VIPs, including the president's widow, a staunch supporter of Hutu power. Despite allegations of French support for the Rwandan government by supplying weapons, the French government continuously denies any involvement. Countless studies have illustrated that if the UN had acted, the devastating Rwandan genocide could have been limited or even prevented. But the silence from international leaders condemned thousands of Tutsis and moderate Hutus to unimaginable suffering, marking a catastrophic chapter in human history. Lifelines Amid Rwandan Chaos In the chaos of the Rwandan genocide, the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, led by Swiss Philippe Gallard, established an emergency field hospital in Kigali. Each day, their ambulances searched for wounded individuals, prioritizing those near death and children. However, Tutsi men faced additional dangers due to the constant threat of death at roadblocks. UN peacekeepers, led by Dollar, supported the ICRC as much as possible within their limited mandate but were encumbered by restrictions and a lack of resources. Despite Dollar's ongoing reports to the UN Security Council, meaningful reinforcements never arrived. Swifter than the international community's response, Kagame's RPF fighters descended upon Kigali, setting off even more catastrophic violence as anti-Tutsi propaganda on RTLM radio continued. Only after more than two weeks of ongoing genocide did the UN Security Council pull out UN peacekeepers altogether, leaving a small force for mediation. This decision remains one of the UN's most ignominious moments in history. Denying Genocide, Global Inaction As the Rwandan genocide unfolded in 1994, the UN and other international agencies and governments were slow to acknowledge or intervene, as they avoided taking responsibility for acting against the atrocities. Despite pleas from officers on the ground and a rapidly growing death toll, the international community hesitated to label the situation a genocide, fearing legal obligations. France, however, played a darker role by supporting and supplying weaponry to the Rwandan government during the slaughter. On April 21, countless Rwandans were dying every day due to their ethnic identities, and the UN decided to withdraw its peacekeepers. With undeniable evidence of the systematic extermination, the UN Security Council failed to confront the reality of genocide and the responsibilities that came with it. While some hesitated to name the atrocities, others like a British Oxfam officer boldly declared genocide after witnessing the deaths of an estimated 500,000 people within just 18 days. Similarly, Unamir Force Commander, Dalair, 
urged international action to prevent genocide accusations, asserting that the world could no longer look away. In their eight-hour debate, the UN Security Council, particularly the UK and United States, were cautious about categorizing it as genocide, fearing legal consequences that would demand an international response. During these prolonged deliberations, Rwanda's tragedy finally caught global attention, but not for the thousands of deaths. Instead, media focused on an unprecedented exodus of 250,000 refugees crossing into Tanzania in a single day. Meanwhile, France played a shocking part in the genocide by financially and logistically supporting the Rwandan government. Despite denial, evidence suggests that $13 million was transferred through the Banque Nationale de Paris and weapons were supplied by the French government or its affiliates to fuel the killing rampage. Pressure from media coverage led UN Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali to change his stance, urging military intervention on a massive scale. He even labeled the events in Rwanda as genocide during a nightline appearance, eventually proposing the deployment of 5,500 troops and additional resources to the UNAMIR force. On May 17, the Security Council approved the relief force, UNAMIR II, but conspicuously avoided using the term genocide in the resolution. Deployment of reinforcements was another story, troops and equipment were not immediately available, and it took over a month for the first reinforcements to reach Rwandan soil. Kagame's Struggle and French Intervention By May, violence in Rwanda had escalated beyond control, and General Paul Kagame of the Rwandan Patriotic Front, RPF, understood that UN intervention was no longer feasible. His forces gained control over much of the country, as the undisciplined Rwandan army failed to keep up. French President François Mitterrand launched Operation Turquoise, a controversial and criticized intervention aimed at protecting threatened populations. The French intervention was perceived differently by various parties, including the UNAMIR II mission, the RPF, and Hutu power. Ultimately, the French created a safe zone in the south, which unintentionally provided refuge for genocidaires, and struggled to contain the RPF, who eventually won the civil war on July 4. As the Rwandan genocide unfolded, General Paul Kagame of the Rwandan Patriotic Front, RPF, faced the harsh reality that the United Nations couldn't intervene effectively. The RPF, far more disciplined than the Rwandan army, had gained control of most major cities by early June, pushing the interim government to the brink. In response, French President François Mitterrand launched Operation Turquoise, a contentious initiative aimed at protecting vulnerable populations. The decision to cover expenses independently of the UN raised eyebrows, with the French press questioning Mitterrand's timing and motivations, given his long-standing knowledge of Rwanda's situation. The RPF saw the intervention as an attempt to save genocidaires, while UNAMIR II mission leader Romeo Dallaire suspected France wanted to prevent an RPF takeover. As Hutu power celebrated the arrival of the French, erroneous information fed to the troops caused confusion. Expecting to confront Tutsi aggressors, French soldiers were unprepared for the shocking accounts of Tutsi genocide. It seemed their understanding of events on the ground was heavily skewed. Once in Rwanda, the French established a safe zone in the south of the country under the guidance of then UN Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali. This zone, however, provided refuge to the genocidaires evading arrest. Despite their intent, the French couldn't stop the ongoing violence, even within the zone they had created. The RPF remained steadfast, continuing their pursuit towards victory. While the French struggled to contain Kagame's forces, the RPF emerged triumphant, seizing Kigali on July 4, a turning point in Rwanda's civil war. In the midst of a brutal genocide and an inadequately prepared intervention, General Kagame's RPF surmounted countless challenges to claim victory, changing the course of Rwandan history forever. Rebuilding Genocide-Torn Rwanda The war in Rwanda was over, but the country was left in ruins, with its people facing unimaginable strife and even death, both within its borders and in refugee camps abroad. Political pressures, international scrutiny, and revelations regarding some global powers' hidden motives further complicated the nation's path to recovery and justice. With the Rwandan capital now in RPF control, 
the devastated nation was forced to begin anew. Buildings had been stripped bare, leaving the streets littered with the corpses of the fallen. Essential resources like food, water, livestock, and crops were non-existent, and the city's population had dwindled to a mere one-sixth of its original size. Meanwhile, Rwandans outside the country faced an entirely different set of challenges. The RPF's advance, along with RTLM's fear-inducing messaging, had led to a record-breaking exodus of one million refugees into Zaire in just two days. These refugees faced harsh conditions in overcrowded camps, with thousands succumbing to dysentery, cholera, and starvation. These camps also bred a resurgence of the Hutu power movement, as individuals seeking to reinvade Rwanda took advantage of the vulnerable refugee population. The international community demanded the RPF form a coalition government. However, the absence of moderate Hutu leaders made governance near impossible. The complexities of this post-war environment were unrivaled, with the surviving Jewish and German populations coexisting uneasily under a Jewish-dominated military. In light of the overwhelming evidence of genocide, the United Nations launched an investigative commission in 1994 which ultimately classified the atrocities as genocide. The International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda was also established, resulting in 36 judgments by 2009, including a life sentence for the leader of the Interahamwe network of death squads, Colonel Theonest Begasora. The role of some global powers in the Rwandan genocide continued to emerge, with evidence indicating that France sought to maintain Rwandan influence. Accusations against the French government ranged from providing training to Rwandan special forces to policy failures and even promoting genocide. Similarly, the United States and the UK faced scrutiny for claiming ignorance of the Rwandan crisis, despite evidence suggesting otherwise. These countries obstructed the Security Council and hindered interventions that could have saved countless lives. Romeo Dallaire, the force commander of the UN Assistance Mission for Rwanda, ultimately concluded that the self-serving and racist policies of these two nations significantly facilitated the genocide. Thus, while Rwanda faced the monumental task of rebuilding and grappling with the haunting legacy of genocide, the behavior of major world powers only exacerbated the country's challenges. As we wrap up our journey through The People Betrayed, the role of the West in Rwanda's genocide, we leave with a deeper understanding of the root causes and the ultimate aftermath of the gruesome 1994 genocide. Melvern's narrative underlines the disturbing truth about the international community's inaction, the complex socio-political landscape, and the legacy of colonialism in Rwanda. This summary has furnished the readers with poignant insights into the harrowing experiences of Rwandans, while unraveling the culpability of global powers such as France, Belgium, the United Kingdom, and the United States in the Rwandan tragedy. Unsettling and thought-provoking, it reminds us of the need for continuous vigilance against ethnic divisiveness, and the crucial role of international human rights accountability, 